In this video, I'm going to tell you the right way to edit the ProRes RAW footage from the Nikon Z6, or at least, at least my way. And we're also going to talk about the pros and cons of ProRes RAW in the Z6 and whether or not you should even do that uh, upgrade for your Z6 at all. So let's do it. Yeah. Greetings, fellow human. My name is Baron. Let's get into the Nikon Z6 ProRes RAW editing workflow fun stuff. Let's do this. Now, the first thing that you're going to want to do is go ahead and go to Nikon's, uh, you know, internet page thing here and get the new in-log LUT. I'll put the links to the site in the description here. So, you know, you pick your operating system. Obviously, I'm on a Mac. You're going to go to down here and accept it. Uh, you know, I mean, you could actually read them because you never know what it's going to say. It, and then uh, select your, I'm, I'm in the USA. That's my region. I'm in the USA. And then I'm gonna download it, huzzah. And once you have downloaded the LUT, go ahead and install it along with the rest of your LUT so you know where to get it, obviously. And you can get to it quickly and easily. And then you're gonna wanna go ahead and fire up Final Cut Pro 10 because as of right now, uh, the ProRes RAW footage is only available on Final Cut Pro 10 and a couple of other little ones like I think Edis or Edis or however you say that one. I, I've never used that one. I, don't know anybody that does use that one, but it can edit ProRes RAW. But as of right now, you know, there's only a few. Unfortunately, Premiere Pro does not yet, at the time of this video, support ProRes RAW, and DaVinci Resolve also does not support ProRes RAW, but Final Cut Pro 10 does. So that's what we're using. First thing you're gonna wanna do is open up a new library for this project. So you're gonna go ahead and name the library, we're gonna name it the Z6 Raw. There we go. This is fairly important. Well, maybe not so important, but it is something to be aware of. Once you have actually loaded this up, go ahead and you know highlight the library that you've done, go to modify, and it's gonna pull out down this little guy here. And it's gonna say, do you want standard or wide gamut HDR? And we are going to choose wide gamut HDR. Now, the reason why we're changing it to wide gamut HDR is because, well, the files that we're putting into this library are, you know, a wide gamut. This is a raw, these are raw files, so they have a large color space and, you know, the luminance levels and chroma levels and all that. So big. It's big. Really, it's, it's, what, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Big. So we want to make sure that it can read all that stuff. It probably doesn't make that much of a difference, honestly, with the ProRes from the Z6, but... Just as a, just to be on the safe side, we're gonna change that to the wide gamut HDR. Go ahead and hit change. The next thing we're gonna wanna do is go ahead and open up a project here. So we have a timeline. We're gonna name the pro, I'm just gonna name it the same thing, Z6 raw. We're gonna make sure it's, uh, I'm gonna do this in 4K. Um, now see down here where it says wide gamut HDR uh, 2020PQ, we're gonna change that to Rec. 709. Now. The reason that we're gonna change that to Rec. 709 is because I am going to be delivering, Let's when I export this out, the video that I want to come out on the other end is gonna be in the 709 color space. It's not gonna be in HDR, uh, it's not gonna be in an HDR color space. But, so my project is gonna be in 709, so that means that all of my scopes and everything as we're working on this should stay in the 709. So, because. Yeah, you get the idea. So go ahead and put it in 709 if that's what you're exporting to. And obviously, if you are doing a project and you need to, you know, you're doing an HLG project, you need to deliver an HLG, then obviously, you know, choose that one. But we're doing 709 because this is going to YouTube. And uh, so we're choosing that one. Go ahead and 4K. I've got ProRes as my rendering, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. So we're going to hit OK there. Now, the next thing we want to do is go ahead and load in our files. Now, I personally do not have a Nikon Z6 that has been upgraded for the ProRes RAW recording. So I was able to find a you know YouTuber here on the internets who did shoot some of this footage and made those clips available for us to play with. It was super awesome of him to do that. So I'm going to leave a link for it. So go check out his video, you know, his clips and go, you can download the clips from there and tell him thanks. Cause that was super nice of him to do that. Let's go ahead and import those clips. Now I stuck them. So I have loaded in 
the clips here. Now I have actually seen a lot of people recommending that you go ahead and go over to the inspector, uh, get the information up and change, uh, just go ahead and change and apply the raw to log conversion for the Sony because as of right now, Apple has not provided a raw to log conversion LUT for the Nikon Z6. So, well, we're not gonna do that here and I'm gonna show you why. So instead, we are going to go and we're gonna take this clip, go ahead and drag it down here into the timeline. Um, so here, as you can see, the highlights over here are very, very blown out. He actually did a pretty decent job here shooting this. So it is exposed fairly well. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go and pick our custom LUT. Now, this is important. You might have another LUT loader for Final Cut Pro X that you prefer over the custom LUT uh, that is provided inside Final Cut. I, I normally use a completely different LUT loader than this. However, for this particular workflow, we gotta use this one, and I'll show you why. So let's apply that custom LUT to the clip, and if you look up here in the inspector, uh, we're going to go to and load up that Nikon uh, LUT that we just downloaded. So we're gonna apply that. Now, as you can see, that looks horrible. It looks absolutely horrible, but don't freak out because the next thing that we do is down here under convert, if it's not open, just open it so it expands this part. Under input, it's set to, by default, to Rec 709. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna set this to Rec 2020 PQ. And all of a sudden, you can see these highlights are way more managed. Everything now all of a sudden looks pretty good. Actually, it's pretty normal. Well, we'll say normal because we haven't made any adjustments yet. And then the output, we're going to keep at 709 because, you know, our end result, we want to be in 709. Now, I have noticed that if you actually switch it over to Rec 2020, boom, you get a whole lot of saturation in there and it doesn't really affect your uh, your contrast or, or anything like that. So if you just want to just crank the color up for whatever reason, you had a super desaturated scene and you really wanted to make it pop a little bit more, you could do that, but we're just gonna keep it at 709. Now here's where this particular system is a little bit different and kind of important. You may know this, some people may not know this, but it, normally you have it ready to work on. We're gonna go ahead and color correct, not grade, but we're gonna color correct this shot. Most of the time, you know, most people's habit is to go ahead and load in a color wheel and just start doing this. So, and this is actually underneath the LUT. So if I go into the color wheels here, let's open that back up. And I start, you know, maybe taking the highlights down a little bit, bringing the mids up and the shadows up so we can see in there a little bit and starting to make some adjustments. Maybe I want to warm it up some and change the tint. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's the normal and typical way that most people are going to approach it, but I'm gonna show you a trick and why this is powerful. So we're gonna take that color wheel and we're gonna move it on top of the LUT, which in Final Cut Pro 10, it's um, all of your effects are in order from top to bottom. So it's gonna run from the each effect going in order. So you're basically staging your effects in the order that you want them to, to go in. So by moving the color wheels, uh, anything that has to do with color and contrast above the LUT, that means we have more fine control and just a better control over what's happening before it goes into the LUT. Now here's a quick explanation on why you might wanna do this sometimes. So a log file, in case you didn't know this, it takes all the information that the camera is shooting and it actually adjusts it into a curve so that it can fit within the 709 color space or whatever color space you're actually shooting in when you have the camera rolling. This one is shooting in 709, so we're in 709. So the log profile for camera shooting in 709 is gonna have that curve to try and cram in as much of the detail as possible. And depending on how that curve works depends on how much detail and chrominance, chrominance and luminance, chrominance, chrominance, chromininominance. So you have that, like you have a natural or a standard profile on your camera. It's going to have a different curve. It may not curve everything else into it, or it might have a harsher fall off in the 
uh, you know, in the highlights. So the highlights might go, might look a little crunchy, or maybe the shadows look a little crunchy. And, you know, those are designed to make certain compromises to have a particular kind of look. And ultimately, when you start color grading and color, color correcting and then color grading, that's what you're doing is you're making those decisions. You're either making these crunchy, that crunchy, uncrunching, whatever you want to do. Now, what's awesome about RAW is it has all of that information there with no curve applied at all. So when this is recorded in the uh, Ninja V, Ninja 5, Ninja, the, the Ninja recorder, um, it doesn't actually apply a log profile at all. It's just all that information. Now, what we've done here is we've uh, taken taken our LUT. That's what is applying that log curve here. So it's actually taking that, and now it's fitting it all into 709. So we're taking, uh, by doing this particular method, it's cramming all that information into a space where we can work with it. But we might want to raise the shadows, lower the highlights, do our color correcting, make the image, you know, really take advantage of that dynamic range as much as possible because it is raw video, we do want to be able to have the most control as possible. So by putting the color wheels and, you know, curves or whatever adjustments that have to do with saturation and exposure, if we put them in front of the LUT, we have greater control because the LUT has not yet squished it. So we can move all that stuff while it's still super expanded. But it's also important to have the LUT already loaded so you can see what you're doing when you apply the LUT. And this isn't a problem in Final Cut Pro. You just do it in order. So we've reset this. So this is just the LUT applied. Now here I can say, okay, maybe I want to bring that up a little bit. We're going to bring the shadows up a tiny bit, maybe kind of do this maneuver. And then I'm going to bring the, maybe the highlights look a little bit harsh right here on that guy so i'm gonna bring that down a little bit but that makes it a little dim so let's do this and then i'm gonna add some there seems to be more color in the shadows here so we're gonna bump that maybe bump some of the mids i don't want to get it too saturated on the highs because yes that's gonna get a little bit gold in there so let's take this down a little bit and that's a little bit harsh let's take the global down just a smidge right about there and we're going to change the temperature we're going to warm it up so it doesn't look so swedish here not that there's anything wrong with it looking swedish but uh you know maybe we want to warm it up some and then we're going to take a little bit of this tint in there because one of the things i noticed was this really cool kind of purplish tint to the highlights that was in the original footage and i want to retain that a little bit so we're going to have that here, but we have a little bit what looks a little bit more natural. So what we started with was this, which is yeah, yeah. Now we're here with some quick corrections. Now, uh, now in a shot like this, we pull this down here into the timeline. This you can see is a much this was shot probably a little bit earlier in the day. Or I think this is at sunrise. So this was probably a little bit earlier. There wasn't quite as much light and it looks quite a bit darker. Now in a situation uh, where we had, were not using raw footage, we could match it and it's gonna take a, a little bit of time. But in this case, it won't take much time at all to do what we need to do. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take the custom LUT, gonna drop it on here super fast. Going to select the, oops, the Nikon. There we go, and 2020 PQ. I'm going to take that color wheel. We're going to apply color wheel two here, and we're going to move the color wheel in front. And it's quite a bit darker than I would like, so let's raise some of these midtones. Let's raise some of the shadows. Get some some more. So let's get a lot of detail out of the shadows. That's starting to look washed out. So let's bring some of this down a little bit. Feeling there, see how much more control it, that we actually have with the footage bef if we're using this before it hits the LUT. Um, then we're going to, let's say, let's bring in, again, we got a lot of saturation that we want to bring up in the mids and the things, but this is because it was earlier in the, you know, let's just go ahead and pull that up and take that down a bit. Um, because this was earlier in the day and there's a whole lot more blues, it doesn't quite match with the previous shot. So let's very quickly in the, let's start with the midtones and let's add some warmth in there real quick. Don't want to add too much purple in there, but let's 
and then some of the shadows. There we go. A little bit of teal. That's a little bit harsh. There we go. How's that looking? We need to start and look there. We need to adjust the tint so that we get a little bit of that in there. And I mean, just eyeballing it here, I don't even have my scopes up. Um, this looks this looks pretty good just eyeballing, and that was that was very very quick. So you can actually do this. Now, granted, this is just the color correction, so this just puts it in a spot where I can just kind of play with it and mess with it and that sort of thing. Now, obviously, if I was really working on it, I'm gonna pull up all of my scopes here so I can see exactly what is happening, so what my saturation is and, you know, what everything is looking here, where my highlights are falling, but, you know, didn't necessarily need to do that with uh, for this tutorial, so we're going to stay in just the standard view here. Now, the other thing that I would do after this is say I want to put a global sort of adjustment over all the clips. Let's say I had a series of four or five clips and I wanted to make basic changes. I would take an adjustment layer there, and then I can add any uh, effects that I might want to do on there. And in this case, I'm not really going to add any effects at all. I'm just going to... Uh, I don't know, let's say, change all of the blues to, or uh, let's see, I don't know, this bluish purple up here. Let's do a global, I have to highlight that. Let's do a global thing here so that these colors are all going to change on all of the things underneath it to look like that. I don't know. And uh, see, it's going to make those changes across the board. And uh, see, see the difference? So that's, um, then I could start building a look, building a grade, whatever I need to do. So as you can see, it is, you know, pretty easy and straightforward to work with the raw footage from the Z6, but you do have to have kind of an idea and understanding of, of how to manipulate the color. It's not as easy as just dropping on a LUT and moving on. You do have to do some more things to take advantage of what's going on with the footage. And if you have ever used raw footage from another kind of codec, like uh, Cinema DNG or, uh, you know, the, some of the Blackmagic uh, stuff, that their raw stuff, the Blackmagic raw things, the, the voodoo, and then the tiny green men that come in and they, they use sanders and they're like, we're going to make it smooth footage with sanders. And so if you've ever worked with uh, raw footage from, you know, any other codec before, you probably will notice here using watching me do this that there are a lot of features that you would assume that you would see here that are just missing like uh, the ability to see all of your settings like what your you know f-stop was and ISO was and everything all that uh, metadata from the file you can't see it here and you don't have dedicated tools like you know an exposure slider or you know some of some more just you know straightforward kind of things that you see in uh, especially like in DaVinci Resolve when you're messing with like the black magic stuff you know, it, it's it's a little bit more straightforward this seems this this is kind of like um like a weird way of doing it and uh and the one thing that i do want to point out that i noticed with some of this footage and some other footage that i um was able to download as well that the highlights if you clip highlights in most raw footage there is normally like some highlight recovery in some ways you can really get some of that detail back and kind of save uh, some of that clipped areas in your scene, but with the Nikon Z6 footage um, And just the way that this system works There's not a highlight recovery tool and if it is clipped it is clipped. It's not this, you know This is not magical. It doesn't just magically, you know, say you have Dynamic range for days for days days and days and days and more days So making sure that you are nailing the exposure is actually still ridiculously important when you're shooting with the z6 in raw So you can't just you know, oh, well, it doesn't matter what the settings are. I'm shooting in raw it, It's not gonna work that way And if you are accustomed to shooting in log profiles, you might be one of those guys who does the ETTR exposure exposing to the right and all that uh, don't want to do that here or if you do that do be very very careful because it's going to be very unforgiving with the clipping just 
letting you know. But one big advantage to shooting in RAW with the Nikon Z6 is that you can shoot your lowest ISO is 100. It's all the way down at 100. Uh, with InLog, it's at 800. That's its native uh, lowest, uh, the native you know, 800 ISO. So quite a bit brighter. You usually, if you're outdoors, you're going to have all kinds of ND on your lenses. But with RAW, you can go all the way down to 100. So you don't have to use as much uh, ND uh, to get the same results. And since I brought up InLog, I would actually, at this point in time, recommend to just stick with InLog rather than upgrade the camera to the ProRes RAW. Although ProRes RAW from the Z6 is pretty cool, it's not the best implementation of RAW in general, and there's some kinks to work out, and maybe we're gonna see some more tools come up with Final Cut Pro, maybe some other NLEs will start um, you supporting ProRes RAW and you know, you'll be able to use it there, but right now it's very limited on how you, how you can work with it. And it doesn't give you a noticeable, um, really, really noticeable gain in dynamic range, which is one of the main reasons why you would want to shoot with RAW. Well, it's not the main reason, well, it, but it's a big reason why you would want to shoot with ProRes RAW. But you don't really get a big boost of dynamic range from using this. In fact, it's pretty much the same dynamic range. The sensor is what the sensor is, and InLog does a great job of maximizing that dynamic range. And if you're used to shooting in a log profile, it is way easier to do that than to mess with this raw footage. Also, Nikon's InLog can be used in any NLE, whereas, as I was saying before, the ProRes RAW from the Z6 can only be used in, you know, a couple of programs, and the, uh, of the big ones, only Final Cut Pro 10 can actually use it, Final Cut Pro X. Is it X or is it 10? I think it's 10, because there were seven, but then they skipped a few. Well, it's Apple, so they do that. They skip numbers. They're like, we don't like those numbers. We're just gonna keep going. Also, the in-log from the Z6 can be recorded to any external recorder. It does not have to be the Atomos Ninja V or 5 or the that one. Because right now, in order to get ProRes RAW, that's the only external recorder that will allow that to happen. So you have one choice if you want to do ProRes RAW with the Z6. Whereas if you want to do InLog, you can use any external recorder. You can use the Blackmagic ones, you can use the Atomos ones, you can use older ones, newer ones. They'll, they'll work. And now that Nikon has an official LUT for the InLog from the Z6 and the Z7, it makes using the color and editing and all that stuff way easier with InLog than what's going on here with the ProRes RAW. When I did my original review of the Nikon Z6, the InLog did not have an official LUT, and it took them a long time to get it out, but it does make a huge difference, and it makes working with it super easy. Super, super easy. So, oh, if you wanted to see my review of the Z6, if you're wondering about the camera in general, I'll put the, there's a thing, I think it goes there, maybe it's there, where the, anyway, and I'll also put a link down in the description for that if you want to see that review as well. They've actually done a couple of upgrades since then. They have improved the autofocus quite a bit since then, which it already had a pretty impressive autofocus to begin with, but they have made it now even more competitive. So the Z6 is an amazing camera. It shoots raw over HDMI, and it also does the in-log. And like I said, I recommend you stick with in-log, but if raw is something that you really want and you really need it and you've convinced yourself, I'm not going to try and convince you not to do it, I'm just think, saying, you know, maybe think about it. You'll probably be happy with InLog. Save you a couple bucks. Maybe buy a lens. Maybe buy a plane ticket to a cool place to shoot. I don't know. If you like this video, do the thing where the thumb goes up. If you did not like this video, do the thing where the thumb goes down. And just go away. We don't want thumbs downing people around here, you jerk. Thumbs down. And if you want to see more videos just like this one or tutorials or anything else that I might feel like making, go ahead and subscribe and you got to ring the bell. Bing! Got to ring it. Bing! And that's everything that I got for you today. I hope you found it useful. So go ahead and take your camera, whatever camera it may be, take it out into the world and go make some awesomeness stuff things. Just do that. Yeah.